Our text is Romans chapter 8, and we're looking at verses 12 through 17. So then, brethren, we are under obligation not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you are living according to the flesh, you must die. But if by the Spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons, by which we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, heirs also, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, so that we may also be glorified with him. May the Lord bless this reading of his word. And let's bow together in prayer. Romans 8 has often been called the chapter of the Holy Spirit. And in our studies of it so far, we have seen something of the multiple ministries of the Spirit. He has freed us from a life of sin and death and empowered us to live free. He lives in us and He gives life to our spirits and will someday give life to our bodies in the resurrection to come. Those are great blessings, but Paul isn't finished. He explains that in addition to all of that, every believer is a child of God. We have been made sons of God. There's no greater privilege than that. But privilege has its responsibilities. It requires a certain behavior. That's true of us, not only because of our position as sons, but also because of all the good the Spirit has done for us. And Paul begins the passage in verse 12 by indicating that the Spirit's gracious and effective ministry to us obligates us to live differently. Since we have been freed from sin and are now indwelt by the Holy Spirit, we are under obligation, Paul writes, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. And now we expect to read the conclusion, but to the Spirit, to live according to the Spirit. But that's not what Paul writes. That's understood, of course, and Paul makes that clear in the passage as it unfolds. But he lays initial stress here on what our debt, what our obligation is not. That is, where it does not lie. Because while we have been delivered from the flesh, from a life of rebellion, the flesh has not yet been eradicated. It still has an influence and a very strong Influence. It is like an old master that tries to enslave us all over again, just like Pharaoh did after he let the children of Israel go. He then tried to recapture them and re enslave them. And that's what the flesh does. But Paul reminds us that we're not under obligation to the flesh. We, we do not have to live according to it, we now have power over it. And in verse 13, Paul gives both a warning and an incentive to use that power to defeat the flesh and live according to the Spirit. It is a matter of life and death. That's how serious this is. Verse 13, 4, if you are living according to the flesh, you must die. But if by the Spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Now the death Paul speaks of here is not physical death, that certainly accompanies what he's speaking of here, but it's not physical death, it is death in its fullest sense. So that Paul is warning that those who do not put to death the deeds of the body will perish eternally. That doesn't mean by perish or die to be non-existent, to be uh, annihilated, but Death in the sense of separated from God for all eternity and all of the bad implications of that. 
Now, Paul is not denying here the security of the believer. Uh, the general theme of Romans 8 is the believer's assurance of salvation. We have security. That's one of the great blessings that we have. But our eternal security does not allow us to presume on God's grace or relieve us of the necessity of defeating sin in our lives. We, we have both the obligation to do that and we have the ability to do that. The Holy Spirit gives liberty and life. He has given us a, a mindset which is inclined toward obeying God and resisting the flesh. That, that is our bent. That is the inclination of our, of our minds and our lives so that we will naturally resist sin. We will naturally act against sin. Believers do fall into sin. Paul has made that very clear in Romans chapter 7. But that is contrary to our new nature. It's contrary to who we now are as a new creation, new creatures in Christ. <clears throat> and that's the struggle. We sin, but the Holy Spirit will not allow us to continue in sin without difficulty or, or vexation he will deal with us, and he'll deal with us in discipline. So the, tr the true believer will persevere in faith and righteousness. That will characterize his or her life, while unbelievers or false believers will not. They don't put to death the deeds of the body. Doing that, mortifying the flesh, as it's sometimes called, it's something of an old-fashioned way of putting it, but uh, it's a good way of putting it. Mortifying the flesh, putting to death the deeds of the body. It doesn't save. We're not saved by doing these things. It's the evidence of salvation. It is the fruit and the proof of the Holy Spirit's sanctifying work in our lives. And we do it by recognizing sin and rejecting it by not giving ourselves opportunity to be enticed by it, avoiding whatever might be provocative or tempting. And Jesus put it graphically when he said that we must gouge out the offending eye and cut off the offending hand. Put it very dramatically to show the danger, the necessity, the importance of dealing with sin. Now, that is dealing with it in the negative sense. Positively, what we do, we deal with sin by remembering who we are. For, we're forgiven. We're free. And so we remember that. We reckon ourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. We remember who we are, and then we fill our minds with what is good, occupying our thoughts with what is pure. That's what Paul says, for example, in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 8, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, and he goes on to list such virtues as that. He says, dwell on these things. Set your mind on things that are pure and true and healthy. Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, he says the same thing. Keep seeking the things above where Christ is. Set your mind on the things above. That's the positive aspect to it. That's what we do. That's an exercise of the mind and the will. To avoid that which is dangerous, to seek that which is good and healthy. We're responsible to do this. To wage a vigorous war against sin. And it, it is that. It's not an easy thing. It's not an easy battle. It calls, calls for constant action. And that's indicated in the expression, putting to death. It's a present tense. We see a lot of those in this passage. A present tense which signifies continuous action. Charles Hodge, the great Princeton theologian, called it a slow and painful process. And it is. It, it, it is a lifelong battle. And one that we must be engaged in. But one that we can only do by the Spirit. Not in our own strength but by the Spirit, as Paul says here.
Holiness is not achieved by our own unaided effort, by our, our methods or formulas. Uh, neither is it achieved by the Holy Spirit apart from our participation. And that's what Paul explains in verse 14 where he gives the reason that true believers put to death the deeds of the body. For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. It's by the Spirit's leading, by His prompting and strengthening that we are able to do what Paul's instructing us to do, that we are able to put to death the, the misdeeds of the body. It's His work of producing holiness, not ours. Now that's evident from the fact that the, the participle being led is passive, which means we don't lead Him, He leads us. We're being led. So the believer's activity in verse 13 of mortifying, putting to death the deeds of the body, killing sin, is the evidence of the Spirit's activity, and His activity is the cause of the believer's activity. We must act, but we can only act by the initial and continuous power and leading of the Holy Spirit. And it is that. It is constant activity. Because again, the, the participle being led is a present tense, indicating that the Spirit's leading is not sporadic. It is continual. Our lives are Spirit-governed lives. He controls us constantly and powerfully, but not violently. He, he leads us. He doesn't drive us. And He leads us in various ways. In ways that we may not even discern or detect. He leads us by enlightening us, by, by showing us our sin, or by showing us what is right, by um, indicating or enlightening our minds so that we understand the truth and we are motivated by it. We are encouraged by it. He, he renews our minds, showing us what's right and giving us a desire for it. Now, Paul speaks of that later in chapter 12 and verse 2, that great exhortation, don't be conformed to this world. It speaks of the renewing of our minds. That's what the Spirit of God's doing. The, uh, the story of the prodigal son illustrates that. He left his father and went his own way, as we, we all sometimes do, and sometimes do often. He lived a riotous life and eventually fell on hard times. You know the story quite well. But at his lowest point, he came to his senses. That's what the text says. He came to his senses. He remembered his father and desired to return to him and determined to do it. Now that's what the Holy Spirit does. He, he brings us to our senses. He gives us good desires. He gives an affection for the Lord. He stirs that up within us. And He does that in connection with the Word of God generally. But He does that. He, he leads us by empowering us, by enabling us to do what is right. He strengthens our wills to, to do what we have learned is right and what is pleasing to the Lord. Paul told the Philippians in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 13, I can do all things through Him who strengthens me. Christ strengthened the Apostle Paul. He strengthens you. He strengthens me through the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God communicates the life of Christ to us. He transfers it into us and strengthens us, enables us. So it's a reminder of something that I say periodically, and that is the Christian life is a supernatural life. We don't live it in our own strength or by our own methods or anything of ourselves. We are to participate and be active, of course. Paul is exhorting all of that, but the only reason we can do that, and the only reason we can even desire to do that and have the proper motivation to do that is because of the Spirit's work within us. He leads. He draws us along. He empowers us. Christian life is a supernatural life. 
He also leads us by directing our minds and wills by impulse, by conviction. He gives us a sense of direction. You, you, you sometimes have a sense, I shouldn't be here. And just know you shouldn't be in a certain place, and so you, you, you leave. Or you have a sense that I need to do this. The Spirit of God does that. I, I, I would give an example for, of this. In uh, Acts chapter 16, Paul's on his second missionary journey. You can look over at it. It's verses 6 through 8, where I think we see this supernatural work of the Spirit. Paul has been through the southern part of Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey, revisiting these churches that he and Barnabas established on the first missionary journey. And then they, they go west, and they seek to go into the province of Asia, where the great city of Ephesus is on the uh, western coast of Turkey. But we read what... We read Luke says in verse 6, having um, that they, they couldn't do that. It says, having been forbidden by the Spirit to speak the word in Asia. So they want to go west, but they can't because the Spirit is forbidding them to do that. And after that, he writes, they came to Mysia. They were trying to go into Bithynia, which is in the northern part. So they can't go west. They've been in the east. They can't go west, so they go north, and they can't go into Bithynia. The Spirit of Jesus did not permit them. And passing by Mysia, they came to Troas. So there at the end, they have one place they can go, to the northwest, and that's to Troas. And there they sit, and they wonder, why are we here? But evidently, the Spirit of God was indicating to them in various ways. We're not told how, but... But he sensed, they sense they can't go here. They can't go here. So they go here. It's uh, the prompting of the Spirit. Giving them a sense of yes and no. And then in all of that is the providence of God. He leads by providence. He guides us through difficult places in life which puzzle us at the time. We wonder, why is this happening? Why am I here? That, that certainly was puzzling to the Apostle Paul. They end up in Troas thinking, we weren't planning to come here, and we're here. And then, of course, they get a vision, Paul does, of a man in Macedonia saying, come over and help us. And then they knew why they were there. God led them. The Spirit of God led them. Said no, yes, and then they had a vision, and they knew where they were to go. But uh, we go through those experiences. We have these providential moments. In fact, all of life is uh, outworking of God's providence. But sometimes we wonder, why is this happening? Well, it's happening for our good. We don't understand it at the time, but what we are to do is trust God and know that He knows what He's doing. Uh, the Christian life, as I said, is a supernatural life. The Christian life is a walk. The Christian life is a march to heaven. It's been called a dangerous journey filled with hazards and enemies. And yet God uses all of that as He guides us, as the Spirit of God leads us. And we can rest in that and know even when it's difficult and confusing and we don't understand what's happening and why it's happening, we can still rest with confidence knowing that we have a guide who is all wise and who is a constant companion. He leads us as He led Israel out of Egypt through the wilderness to the promised land. You remember He led them to water and provided them with food, heavenly food, manna. The Lord constantly led them in the pillar of cloud by day to shield them from the sun, the heat of day, and a pillar of fire by night to protect them from the cold of the desert and give them warmth and light. When the pillar moved, the people moved. When it stopped, they stopped. It was, again, a dangerous journey, but they were safe because He was with them, guiding them as He's with us, leading us better than we know. So we're to trust Him and not choose our own way. We don't know what the right circumstance is for our life. We may think we do, but we don't. 
we have this assurance, God does know. And He is leading us and leading us to holiness. Now that, that is a huge blessing. He is leading you just as He led the children of Israel. Just as He led them to water, He's leading you to holiness. And He does so faithfully because you are dear to Him. You are sons of God. Whether you are male or female, you are son. Paul explains that in verse 15 along with the privileges of being God's children. We have a close personal loving relationship with God as our Heavenly Father. It is a relationship of peace and security, not one of slavery and fear. Because we have received, Paul writes, a spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father. That expression, spirit of adoption, is, well, is best taken as a reference to the Holy Spirit since uh, he's really the great subject of this chapter. The emphasis of the passage is on the Spirit's work. So Spirit here is a reference to the Holy Spirit. He's the Spirit of adoption because He creates in God's children the family love that characterizes our relationship with God. He, has, he doesn't produce slavery and fear, but freedom and confidence. And adoption illustrates the, the closeness and security of that relationship. It's a very important word. The significance of it may be somewhat lost on us in modern times because the implication of adoption was different for the Greeks and for the Romans in their culture of the first century AD than, than for us today. An adopted son was deliberately chosen by his adoptive father in order to perpetuate the father's name and so that the son would inherit his estate and continue it. He was not considered, the adopted son, not considered inferior to the natural son. In fact, F.F. F. Bruce wrote that he might enjoy the father's affection more fully and reproduce the father's character more worthily. Now that's the idea that Paul expresses here. We are not God's natural sons. Only Christ is that. He is the unique Son of God, the eternal Son of God. We're not that. We are temporal. We are not the natural sons of God, but uh, by grace we have been made adopted sons, adopted into His family, and we are no less loved by the Father. We have, he loves us as He loves His own eternal Son. In fact, we enjoy the Father's full affection and have such open and personal access to Him that we can address Him as Abba, Father. Abba is uh, an Aramaic term for Father, which Jesus used when He was in the Garden of Gethsemane, undergoing His greatest trial as He faced the cross and sweat blood. It's recorded in Mark chapter 14 and verse 36. Abba, Father, He said, all things are possible for Me. Remove this cup from Me, yet not what I will but what you will. Well, that's how he prayed. And the disciples heard that and they were deeply impressed by his use of that word because Abba is a very personal word for Father. It, it's the equivalent to Papa or Daddy. And, and while the, the world would have been, the word rather would have been used in, in everyday life by children within a Jewish home, the Jews would never, never have addressed God in such a familiar and personal way. But Jesus did. And, and with the new dispensation and the giving of the Holy Spirit, 
he enters our hearts crying, Abba, Father, giving us that intimacy so that his cry as he comes into our hearts becomes our cry. The way he speaks is the way we speak. And the significance of that may have been clearer to Paul's Roman audience than it is to us because in a Roman household, the father was an august figure. He was a person of great authority. He literally had the legal right to put members of his household to death if they displeased him. That was the nature of his position, the nature of his authority. And that image uh, very much lies behind the picture that Paul gives here of the Christian's relationship to God. Jesus told people not to fear those who kill the body, but fear him who is able to destroy bo both soul and body in hell. Uh, by nature, we have every reason to fear God because we merit that very end. And God has that authority to cast us in to hell. We are as, as guilty men before the judge, but in Christ that relationship is changed. And that's how he begins this, this great chapter. There is that, there, th therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That relationship has changed. God has not changed, but his relationship to us has. And so the picture that Paul gives is that of drawing close to an imposing person without fear or inhibitions, but complete confidence and security and joy. Now, I don't know how much the modern church, and I'm speaking really of the modern evangelical church, appreciates that privilege. It, it, has, uh, it has largely lost the sense of God's transcendence and glory. He, is now more a companion than uh, an august holy person. Uh, a lot has been written on this uh, over the past 20, 30 years. How God has, <clears throat> in, in the description of one of the prominent writers on this subject, <clears throat> how God has become weightless in the evangelical church. And the idea of that is God is holy, and the basic idea of holiness is weight, heaviness, but in the ideas of so many people today, that he's not that. That, that, that aspect of God has become unimportant. <clears throat> the emphasis is not on knowing the, the doctrines of the faith and knowing God. All of that has been, has been sort of pushed to the margins today. And that, and that is fatal. Because if, if we don't learn doctrine, we can't know about him and know him as he is which is a glorious, uh, self-sufficient, self-existent, all-powerful God. We can't appreciate, if we don't understand that, the, the blessing Paul describes here. And so think of it. The one who created everything out of nothing, before whom the nations are like a drop from a bucket, Isaiah said, before whom they are like a speck on his scales. What's that make us? If the nations are like a drop, what are we like? And yet that God has made us his cherished sons. And, and that is particularly amazing in light of what he's already said, what Paul has said. In, in verses 5 through 8 about our natural rebellion and our deadness and our refusal to do the things that please God. Um, yet God has so intervened in our lives that He's changed us and He has even made us into His children. And knowing that should give us confidence in a crisis or time 
uh, like that and should give us joy as well uh, to, to feel confident, to draw near to him at all times, like a child to his father, to be received by him with complete acceptance, affection, and help. That's what Paul is saying here. And, and as you think about it, it's an amazing fact. That's what the Holy Spirit gives us. That is the relationship He has brought us into with God Almighty. It is one which, in which we can call Him Abba. The Jews address God as Adonai. The Muslims have 99 ways to address Allah. But as J.I. Packer has written, Father is the Christian's name for God. The, the very fact that we have the confidence to call God Father, <clears throat> and in fact the, the necessity to cry out Abba is evidence that we are children of God. But of course a person could be presumptuous or, uh, or self-deceived and think that he or she is God's son or daughter when it, it really wasn't true, or conversely have doubts about that when it was true. So in verse 16, Paul gives another proof of sonship, which is the internal witness of the Spirit, of the Holy Spirit, to that fact. The Spirit Himself, Paul writes, testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. The Holy Spirit works jointly with, with our conscience our inner self, to convince us that we are God's children. So it is both spirits together bearing witness to our salvation. William G.T. Shedd wrote, It is as if when the believer says, I am a child of God, the Holy Spirit answers, Thou art indeed a child. Uh, the, the Spirit speaks to our spirit communicates that confidence to us. It is a, an internal thing. We could call it a subjective experience, but it's, it's, it's only subjective in the sense that it's an objective experience going on within us, in our hearts, and our minds. The Spirit it never stops giving His internal witness. And that again is the implication of the present tense. He continually gives us conviction, continually gives us confidence of His Sonship. Now doubts may come. They do. They come for all of us, I think. But the, the Holy Spirit continues to witness to our spirits so that our doubts don't overcome us. So that in the end, His witness cannot be stifled or defeated. Now, it doesn't come to us in, in an audible voice or in the feeling we get when we hear some beautiful symphony. It, it can involve emotion, but basically it is a settled confidence that God gives us by the Holy Spirit. In Romans chapter 5, verse 5, Paul said that God has poured out His love into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. He does that for us. He makes us know that He loves us and He stirs up within us a love for Him. Now verse 17, in, in, in verse 17 Paul draws some implications from all of this for the future. <clears throat> and there, there are great implications, there are great truths. The first is because we are sons we're heirs. We are heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. As adopted sons, we all have the rights and privileges of God's family. We have them equally. Male, female, slave, free, rich, poor, regardless. We all have equal access to God. We all have equally the privileges of the family of God. But they are not now complete. We don't have everything now. We have an inheritance, meaning more to come, and really the best is yet to come. All that God has promised us. We will inherit heaven. We will inherit the earth and the kingdom to come in Christ's millennial reign. 
We will inherit the new heavens and the new earth for all eternity. What will all of that be like? Well, it's beyond our comprehension. Paul wrote to the, the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 2, 9, Eye has not seen and ear has not heard all that God has prepared for those who love Him. Now that is the hope that we have. The hope is what, and that hope is what Paul will unfold in verse 18 with the glory that will be revealed to us. He speaks of it there. But the greatest part of that inheritance, of that glory, will not be the golden streets and the pearly gates and the regenerated universe that we will occupy. That will be glorious, no doubt. But the greatest part will be that we'll be with Christ. Here he calls us fellow heirs with Him. Without Christ, the, the, the world to come would be riches without joy. It would be a sterile thing. Imagine inheriting a fortune and having no one to share it with, ha having a man mansion filled with treasures, but, but uh, having it alone without those you love. We will not be alone. We will be with Christ, with the triune God, in an ever deepening relationship with Him. So as much as we have now, and we have more than we can possibly enjoy and experience and live in the brief moment of life that is ours, the best is yet to come. But lest we become so enamored of the future that we become neglectful of the present, Paul reminds us that before a crown, before a crown is a cross. Suffering in this world is another implication that Paul gives. If children, heirs, if indeed we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. Because we are joined to Christ, because we are sons with him, we must experience his life. We must experience his sufferings. And Jesus told his disciples that. He alerted them from the beginning. He told them to take up their cross and follow him. And he gave them these warnings of the difficulties they would have in the world in his last sermon or conversation with them in, uh, in John chapter 14 and 15. Hardship and suffering for the faith is inevitable but necessary not only for perfecting us, which it does, and preparing us for the inheritance to come, but also for proving that we are sons and heirs. John Bunyan illustrated that with Pliable at the beginning of uh, Pilgrim's Progress. Pliable, you remember, is this character who joins Christian as Christian leaves his house. He runs from his house, going on his way to the celestial city first, though, to go to that wicked gate, that little gate off in the distance, and he runs off shouting, life, life, eternal life. Well, Pliable hears him or sees him and says, I'm going to join him. And he joins Christian on his journey, and all Pliable can talk about is this heavenly city, and he wants to talk about this great glory that's coming. And yet, all along their brief time together, he didn't carry that burden that Christian had on his back. So not long before they begin, you know, they stumble into the slough of despond and it's a miserable experience and they finally climb out and Pliable finally gets out of the slough. He quits the whole thing. He's disgusted. He didn't expect that to happen and he goes back to the city of destruction where he's ridiculed by everyone. And Christian, on the other hand, after his great struggle, leaves, gets out of the slew of despond, and he goes on. Now, he's not, uh, he hasn't reached that point of salvation yet in the allegory, but it gives an example of what we go through. We, have, we must persevere through, through the trials of life. And even when Christian comes to that wicked gate and he sees the cross and the burden of sin falls from his back and tumbles down into that ditch and he never sees it again, while he begins rejoicing on his way, he begins to meet all kinds of difficulties along the way. In fact, I think someone said it's just, Pilgrim's Progress is as much about 
Christian and his companions getting off the path as it is staying on the path. But he meets faithful, and they go through Vanity Fair, where they're arrested and faithful is killed. And then as, as Christian leaves there, he meets hopeful, but they end up being captured by giant despair and put in his doubting castle where they spend time in the dungeon, languishing. That's the Christian life. It has all kinds of difficulties. Christians suffer all kinds of hardship in this life. God did not call us to comfort and ease in this world. He, he gives us that, and He gives us a lot of that, but often the vital Christian life is one of difficulty, and the more vital it becomes and the more diligent we are in it, the more difficult it becomes. So that's not a sign of God's disapproval. That's really a sign of His approval. We see that in the lives of the great saints in the book of Acts. Paul and John were jailed at the very beginning. Stephen and then James were killed. Paul was beaten and stoned. That was expected. Paul said at the end of his first missionary journey, after he had been stoned and left for dead in Lystra, through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. Believers do not have an easy path. God has put us on a dangerous journey. But our tribulations are not without purpose. We suffer in order that we may also share in Christ's glory. The path of suffering is the path to glory. But how are we able to take that path? That's, that's difficult. In fact, it seems more than we can do. In fact, it is more than we can do. But we can because the Holy Spirit who indwells us, who gives life, leads us, and enables us. But also when we realize what we once were, slaves to sin and death, and what we now are by grace, sons and daughters, heirs of God, then love Gratitude is motivation for obedience. And that's our obligation, as Paul has said. We're not obligated to the flesh any longer. Our obligation is really to put to death the deeds of the flesh. And we can do that and we can live obediently because of the Spirit of God who dwells within us and is leading us now, constantly leading us. Even when we go astray, He draws us back. So we're able to do that. We're able to live according to what we are, sons and heirs. Are you a son and heir? Do you have the assurance? Do you have that inner witness? You are a son. You are an heir. You are a child of God if you have believed in Jesus Christ as Savior. That's all that's required. Natural birth can't give us a place in God's family. We can't work to gain this greatest of all inheritances. It's all a gift of God which we receive through faith alone. Christ gained it at the cross when He died for sinners. So if you know that you're a sinner, then believe in Christ and receive forgiveness and eternal life. Become a child of God, a son and heir. May God help you to do that and help you to live as one. May He do that for all of us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your goodness to us. We thank you for uh, all that Paul describes here. <clears throat> what a privilege we have. We have the Holy Spirit who enables us to live as we ought to live. And how ought we to live as believers in Jesus Christ? According to what we are. Sons of God. Your sons. You've adopted us into your family and we are heirs of an eternal, infinite inheritance. Thank you for that. Motivate us. Strengthen us. May we yield every day to the leading of the Spirit and glorify you. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.